Hey everybody, in this video, we're gonna discuss one of the most influential papers in a number of fields from science and technology studies to information ethics, to information systems and human computer interaction uh, and on and on and on. This paper is, Do Artifacts Have Politics? It was written in 1980 by this man, Langdon Winner. He's a professor at the Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in New York. And this paper was first published back in 1980 but it's been reprinted any number of times. And it's sort of one of these papers that is evergreen. Like there's always um, new, new ways to apply it and new things to say about it and think about it. And so it's just as relevant today as it was in 1980. And so this is you know, one of these papers that's indispensable for anybody in any field that's around society, politics, technology, and so on. And in this video, I'm just gonna give us a brief overview of what's going on in the paper. And if you're interested, I invite you to dig in and read the full paper to yourself. Hopefully it'll be an easier journey with this you know, overview first. So let's start with the title. I mean, as you can probably guess, in this paper, Winner is going to try and answer this question. Do artifacts have politics? Well, what does that even mean to begin with, right? It's sort of an obtuse, uh, very academic way to word this question. Basically what he's asking is, do technologies have political properties or are there political aspects to our technologies right we might not think so we might just say technologies are totally neutral um, you know it's the person not the technology these kinds of things but he's going to make the case that artifacts do have politics that there are inherently political properties in our technologies so let's start out with some definitions so what does he mean by these terms first first po uh, politics he defines as a distribution of power, authority, and privilege in a community. Okay, so you have power, authority, privilege, these different kind of dynamics and social relations, and how those are distributed throughout whatever community you're uh, talking about. And next, technology. What is technology? Well, this is a, you know, a, a rabbit hole kind of question. Um, but how he's defining technology in this paper is a way of building order in our world. So even though this is, you know, highly relevant to digital technologies and discussions of things like, for example, facial recognition technology, he has a, a much bigger idea of what could be technology here. Everything to include um, the shape of roads, right? Um, all, anything, any, any way that we're, you know, taking the chaos of the world and trying to bring order to it. That's technology for, for winner here. And so as I already alluded to, in this paper, he's saying that artifacts, technological artifacts, yes, they can contain certain political properties or arrangements of power, um, authority, privilege, and so on. Um, and he says that there's two main ways that artifacts have politics. The two ways are by decision and by necessity. Okay, so first let's talk about by decision. This means that um, the technology, it has the capacity to have political um, arrangements to it, but it doesn't necessarily imply any particular political setup, okay? So for example, roadways, bridges, um, automobile like shapes, right? There's all sorts of ways that we can uh, arrange those. Let's think of the, the shape of a classroom, for example. Um, you've probably been in classrooms before, right? We have on one hand the traditional auditorium, right? Where there's, you know, 400 seats all facing the same direction, which is the professor, right? And so this, this does show a certain um, political arrangement where everybody's expected to be looking at this one person. This person is expected to project to this huge room because they have all these important and smart things to say, right? Um, versus a different kind of classroom where the, the chairs swivel and move around and you can sit in a circle or maybe there's big tables that you can sit around, right? that uh, has a different kind of political quality to it where it's more egalitarian and discussion-based and so on. All right, I think probably the, the most famous example that comes out of Winner's paper here, this is the one that everybody remembers long after they've read it, is about the bridges in Long Island, New York. And this also really nicely illustrates this uh, first way that technologies can have politics by decision, okay? So um, even though Bridges of any kind will have political qualities. It's not, it's not uh, already a given what qualities they'll have. Um, so Winner discusses the bridges in Long Island, New York. Here's a photograph that you can see of one of those bridges. 
Um, and basically the bridges over the parkways in Long Island are very low, as you can probably even tell just from this photo. Um, and they're low such that they prevent certain vehicles from passing underneath. This is the work of Robert Moses. He was a designer of roads, parks, bridges, other public works for a 50 year span from the 1920s to the 1970s in New York. And according to evidence, he created bridges like this in Long Island, specifically out of class and racial bias. Um, he had a very nice beach that he designed, Jones Beach in Long Island. And uh, basically, explicitly, he didn't want poor people there. He didn't want black people there. Yikes. So, you know, so how does he achieve this goal? Well, he realized that um, the rich people, the white people, the comfortable middle classes, as he said, own cars and cars are a lot lower than buses. The poor people have to take the buses, right? And so if he could design um, bridges like this so that buses couldn't pass underneath, then you don't need to worry about the, uh, the people you don't want coming to your beach is basically how it went. And so um, this is still a problem in, in Long Island even today is these low bridges. Um, so that's one example of by decision, right? Bridges aren't necessarily that low uh, you have to choose to make them that low for these particular reasons, okay? Let's talk about the other form, which is by necessity. Sometimes uh, technologies require a certain kind of political arrangement. They might require it or they might just be strongly compatible with it. Uh, for example, nuclear power plants. If you want nuclear energy, you need a nuclear power plant. And this basically requires a centralized authority. You need a huge area um, with very specialized equipment, very qualified people, certain staff, certain other infrastructure around it, right? Um, you can't just do nuclear power willy-nilly. On the other hand, if we're talking solar power, solar power is much more conducive to a distributed uh, kind of manifestation, right? You can have solar power on your own house and be totally off the grid. Okay. Um, other technologies that require a certain arrangement would be like uh, the atomic bomb, right? Uh, or railroads or oil pipelines, refineries, like a lot of these big infrastructural things often will require or um, be strongly compatible with, uh, which he kind of wraps up into this one category of by necessity. So um, basically when we, when we one of his main arguments is when we talk about the complex, big technologies today, they mostly fall under number two here. So here's a quote from the paper. The available evidence tends to show that many large, sophisticated technological systems are in fact highly compatible with centralized, hierarchical, managerial control. Okay, and so we can think about this, you know, because a lot of our technologies that we use every day from our computers, um, to whatever, I mean, political systems, they're so big, they're at this point so unwieldy um, that they kind of require this, this sort of top-down managerial control, centralized thing. And uh, if we want them to be more distributed, well, then there's a, a mismatch, okay? So to kind of wrap this up, he poses this decisive question towards the end of the paper that when we're considering any technology that we want, might want to adopt, we're faced with two questions. The first question is, well, do we even adopt it in the first place? And then if we do want to adopt it, the next question is, what form should it take? Okay, so remember we had these two ways that technologies can be political, by decision or by necessity. If the politics of a technology are by necessity a certain way, then the most important question is number one, should we even adopt it? But if the technology admits of different ways to manifest it, like solar power, right? Um, you can have centralized solar power or you can have very distributed solar power. If that's the case, then the decisive question is what form should it take? Okay, so this is a very interesting framework. It will, I mean, you can use it to kind of think through the political properties of any technology that you use, um, whether it's, you know, the, the physical device of your smartphone or I mentioned before, facial recognition technology, right? What do you think? Is that more um, compatible with centralized authority or does it admit of like a more egalitarian distributed uh, mode? Um, 
And this is, you know, useful to think through, you know, whether you're just a user, you can kind of decide, you know, what technologies you want to use in your life, or if you're designing something, creating something new, thinking through, you know, what does it mean to be bringing this into the world? Or um, if you're in a business, for example, and you're deciding whether we adopt, you know, information system A or information system B to do such and such process, um, it's, I mean, it's a very interesting framework to think through. So this was just a really brief overview of some of the big ideas from the paper. If you're interested, again, I would invite you to dig in and read the paper. Um, and uh, I hope you enjoy it.